of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> And roll call, Mrs. Mayor, if you would do the roll call, please. Cheryl Hancock. Here. Anita Jagosinski. Here. Kate Mayer. Here. Tim Menninger. Here. Colin Trivet. Here. Lisa Collins. Here. Gary Dunlap. Here. Joe Gittens. Here. Okay, thank you. With seven of the seven school board members present, I would declare a quorum. Approval of the agenda. I would note that the agenda has been posted, distributed, and sent to the local media. With this in mind, are there any changes? Okay, seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as published. So moved. Motion and a second? Yep. Any discussion? Seeing none, all of those in favor of approving the agenda as published, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Public participation. Is there anyone who wishes to address the board relative to any item at this time? We ask that a five minute time limit per person be followed. Please come forward, state your name, address, and topic to be addressed. Okay, I don't see anyone coming forward, so then we will move on to reports and discussion. Business Services 2012 13 budget revisions, including fund balance designations. Mr. Clark. The order of those on the agenda, I co I'll cover both of them, but uh, the order of those on the agenda first is the fourth quarter budget adjustments. As you may recall, three times throughout the year, the board's asked to consider budget adjustments. These come after the original budget adoption uh, in November. Uh, you've received an issue paper uh, in your packet. Uh, you've also received a, oh, thank you. So that our audience. Uh, uh, this is the issue paper which I'm showing at this time. Uh, in addition to the issue paper, you have an itemized breakdown of the uh, budget adjustment entries uh, that are being presented, as well as the uh, DPI format uh, reflecting uh, those revisions, column F being the revisions, uh, and each of the line items within the uh, budget represented on that spreadsheet. Uh, starting with the revenues on page one and then moving to expenditures uh, by fund uh, on the subsequent pages. Um, I'm not going to go into any more detail other than to say that uh, these adjustments represent uh, open enrollment expenditure adjustments, adjustments to less in Medicaid reimbursements than we had anticipated, uh, an increase in special education categorical aid over what we had anticipated, uh, gift account adjustments, uh, those adjustments, um, we really underestimated uh, what we'd receive and spend in the gift account. As you remember, the gift account is pretty much a, a flow through account. Dollars come in and we then um, redirect those monies for the expenditures that the party bringing us the gift um, would like them to be used for. Um, Interfund transfers, uh, there was a significant adjustment. This is an uh, interfund transfer between general fund, 10 fund, and uh, 27 fund, our special education program fund. And that ties back to that categorical aid. Uh, remember I mentioned earlier we're going to get more on categorical aid. Uh, that categorical aid being directed uh, to meet the needs of special needs students, that meant that we had uh, less of a need for interfund transfers into uh, the special projects or special needs budget. So that's a summary of those items. I do have the uh, detailed entries if you'd like me to go through those, but the um, spreadsheet then is what you'd be asked to approve to represent uh, the cumulative uh, changes uh, in June. And then do you want, do you want me to go to the right to the other one or? Go ahead. I just have a, a very easy clarifying question on the 2012-13 um, budget revisions expense report. Um, the accounting person in me when he sees a negative in an expense report, that's actually a reduction in expense. Is that correct? You go down and have us all join you here, Mr. Mettinger. And I assume that this is the sheet you're referring to. Um, actually, no. That was the other Excel spreadsheet. 
that uh, broke it down and, and gave a little more description. Oops. It would be the uh, 7.1 C. C. Let me see if I can make those numbers a little bit larger so that we can. And I just, because that's an expense report, when I see a negative in an expense report, I always think that's a reduced expense. That is correct. Okay. Thank yep. you. So those expenditures are being re reduced. reduced from the original budgeted amounts. Perfect. I just wanted to make sure that I was. Thank you for the opportunity to clarify. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Then moving on. Okay, the other item you have uh, before you is the <clears throat> fund balance designation. Uh, as you'll remember in the issue point, paper points out, the school board is asked annually to take action to designate <clears throat> the purpose uh, for financial resources in the form of fund equity. Uh, we ask you to do this prior to June 30th because these uh, amounts, these fund balance amounts, will be reviewed by the auditor. You see the fund balance amounts uh, listed there um, on the bottom half of the page. You have a specific recommended designation for uh, all of those uh, fund balance amounts. There are specific accounting categories for these, uh, non-spendable, restricted spendable, committed spendable, assigned spendable, and unassigned spendable. Um, so, uh, and the definitions are offered on those as well. And then you can see what the purpose is for each of those um, designated amounts. Um, this is similar to what you receive each year. In fact, I went back and looked at last year and the amounts are not that dissimilar either. So uh, are there any questions on the fund balance designation issue paper? Any questions? Both of these items are in the consent agenda, so we would be approving them this evening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Then moving on to building and grounds facilities maintenance study. Mr. Clark and Mr. Daly. Oh, I'm sorry. I did skip over the health insurance, Mr. Clark. Business Services Health Insurance. <clears throat> uh, a couple of things uh, regarding on the agenda tonight. First of all, I had shared with you that in your board packet that was sent out to you on Wednesday, the incorrect issue paper, actually the original one was put in there. Since then, that's been revised. If you remember over a week ago, a revised copy following the June 10th board meeting was sent out to you. So tonight, uh, in the Dropbox, those of you that are accessing your Dropbox, actually there's a revised B uh, for you. That's actually the recommendation. And there's also a paper copy for you in your blue folder. Um, so since the June 10th board meeting, your discussion, you had asked for uh, information to be forwarded to you that was presented that evening. That was done. I think Mrs. Hancock had asked a question and some work to try to uh, respond to that had been done. Uh, we've put all that information, uh, the PowerPoint, so on, on the district website as well, and taken uh, some employee questions. Um, I would have to say that, um, you know, any of the questions, there, there's the ongoing concern, probably not a surprise to anybody, of uh, the increase in the out-of-pocket expenses, especially for, um, well, those um, ones that max out. And so that is a continued uh, question or concern uh, with that. Um, I don't know, I haven't been able to measure what, how much of a difference there's been um, when people learned of what was actually is being recommended with the introduction of the HRA reimbursement. Um, but uh, for tonight, we placed this on the reports discussion in addition to the consent agenda to give the board further opportunity to discuss um, uh, this issue if needed. And, be able, and we would be prepared to respond to questions as best as we can. I've had very few questions since two weeks ago. Um, 
And uh, what I see tonight is options would include approving the recommendation as presented, um, not approving the recommendation as presented, and if that were to occur, then uh, perhaps does that mean some kind of modification to the recommendation, or does that mean uh, the board is wishing to leave the current plan unchanged? Um, I suppose a third option would be to table this item, and I know in the past we've reviewed um, some, some issues related to timelines and things like that, and we could go over that if needed for you tonight. So with that, um, I think it's this opportunity again for the board to have further discussion if you, if you need, need to. I'm wondering if anyone else is having trouble that is on wireless getting into their Dropbox because I am and Anita is. I'm good. You're able to open up the attachments? Yep. Mm. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. And I couldn't log into my email so I wanted to talk about the email that you had sent um, with those numbers so I'm not able to get it to log in. Do you like mine, Cheryl? No, that's okay. So, um, you've got the position paper in front of you um, with the recommendations, and so we really are, I think it was presented what the long-term presentation was going, or long-term potential was going to be, but tonight we're just focusing on the 2013-2014 plan, which, um, Mr. Clark, would you come forward and just clarify for the board, um, what the proposal is for 2013-2014, just briefly. Let me grab one. Sure. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. The uh, plan for 13-14 um, changes um, some components of the current plan we would we would stay with the same type of plan I know there was talk about HMO PPO uh, point of service plans we're on a PPO plan um, the deductibles would be increased so uh, pardon me just would you clarify sure uh, I, uh, I'll focus on the in network yes uh, rather than the in and out of network, but on the in network uh, would change from uh, $100 on a single plan to uh, $500 on a single plan, and uh, deductible on a family plan from $200 to $1,000. Uh, would introduce a co insurance at 90% as opposed to the current 100%. Would include um, maximum out of pocket on a single plan of one thousand dollars versus one hundred currently would introduce a two thousand dollar maximum out of pocket on a family plan uh, which is currently two hundred dollars um, increases the office visit copay um, to $25 from $20. There are some changes to the prescription drug co-pays. Uh, currently we're at zero, five, and 20. Um, that would go to zero, 10, 25, and 50. So there's another layer of co-pays uh, included. The emergency room uh, co-pay uh, is currently $100, uh, then 100% 100 uh, of the co-insurance limit, and that co-insurance of 90% would apply to that visit as well, although the um, copay amount stays at $100. And then um, the other change would be that uh, an HRA plan, a reimbursement plan would be introduced. Um, we currently don't have a plan there would be $250 uh, on a single plan and $500 HRA 
on a family plan. Uh, in addition, the uh, recommendation includes uh, wellness uh, initiatives, uh, incentives uh, offered to the um, employees. Um, it adds um, <coughs> domestic partners as an eligible class for coverage uh, over the current plan. Um, and uh, I think that's it. I'm going to turn and ask Janice Waver, did I miss anything? That's a, that's a, a pretty detailed summary of what I have here on a sheet of paper, but uh, what we're really recommending is the same thing that came to the board in written form last month. I'm trying to go through it so that the audience at home has an idea of what it is that we're talking about. I appreciate that. So that is what would be before us on the consent um, agenda. Are there questions? This is, we put it up front so that we could have some. I have some questions. I don't know if you want to answer them, Jay, or if Janice wants to answer them. Um, do you have any idea what the deduct, or not the deductible, what the um, premium costs will be for next year? What Janice said in response was that has not been released yet. Um, we had shared information uh, at the last meeting that it could be as high as 15 percent. Um, that's what we're seeing as rate increases um, in other uh, districts where they're not changing the plan uh, that they have. That seems to be trend, and there's some Affordable Care Act um, uh, that's driving uh, premium increases up as well. Okay. That would be accurate. This is on. Excuse me. And um, the medical trend is a factor. Uh, Health care reform are another percentages that are building into the rate renewals for uh, for September 1. And also the group's own utilization, which we're exceeding the utilization when you look at premiums to claims. Okay. So it, a guess would be 15 percent? I would think that would be a fair assessment. Okay. Okay. And then um, let's see. How many, how many people, Janice, would you say reach the maximum out of pocket? Because I've had some people contact me, and I understand their concerns with the, the, the maximum out of pocket cost increasing so drastically. But they're, I, I'm wondering how many people actually reach the maximum out of pocket. Like what percentage of people? I know for myself personally, I think we've been married for like 25 years and I think we reached it once or maybe twice. And I'm not saying that to downplay, you know, the importance of those figures to the, the staff members, but I'm, I'm just curious to, for them to be able to prepare themselves mentally if this passes. Jay, do you want me to speak on this? Okay. First, yeah. Uh, first of all, with your current plan design where you have a max amount of pocket of $100 for single and 200 for family, my best estimation is 100% of your members reach right. it because well, of the yeah. low participation. On the norm, when you go to a higher deductible plan, the impact on the group is usually about 20% will reach the max amount of pocket or have exposure that would meet that qualification. When it's in the five two to 5,000 range, you mean? Correct. Okay. That's the, always the underwriters or the actuarial's thought process is about 20% will be. Um, it's a learning curve also for your membership. You know, we're, we want to really uh, promote the wellness incentives. We, can, we certainly have identified where some of the health risks are, and I feel with the proper education and working with the employees that hopefully we can improve in some of those areas. And could you just clarify for the audience and the people who are watching what the difference is between the deductibles and the maximum out-of-pocket? Certainly. The deductible is the upfront amount that a member would have to pay for certain types of medical conditions. Right now, if they would go in for a routine office visit, they would pay $20, and that would pay for the 100% of that office visit charge. It would be if they have any type of diagnosis testing in or out patient surgical procedures that actually applies towards the deductible. So once the deductible's been met, the next level of cost sharing is called co-insurance, and currently you have 100%. The proposed plan is at 90% which would mean that the health plan would pick up 90% of the allowable charges and the member would be responsible for 10%. So then the deductible and coinsurance equals your maximum out of pocket. It's a combination of deductible and coinsurance to reach your maximum out of pocket. 
So that would be the maximum exposure for a member if they incur medical cost. Your prescription co-pays, your emergency room co-pays, and your office visit co-pays do not apply towards the deductible co-insurance or maximum out of pocket. That part we would encourage members to use your flexible spending plan for, for predictable medical costs that incur as a co-pay. Okay. Uh, Can I add to that you. just uh, one of the things that Janice has uh, brought up on several occasions, which I think is a fitting uh, part of the response to Anita's question, are um, alternatives to make sure that you don't incur those out-of-pocket costs, and the plan design has some features. So wellness visits, those things that help us prevent, prevent us from being uh, needing medical services, and the other one is the uh, family clinic. And Janice, I wondered if you'd address those two strategies to avoiding having out-of-pocket costs. With the wellness benefits that are in place with the health plan, any member that goes in for what we consider preventative care, the office visit copay and the deductible coinsurance do not apply. It's covered at 100% with no uh, cost for the member or their family members. We also have a special relationship with the Neighborhood Family Clinic, which is led by Dr. Thompson. And if any member goes to one of his facilities, there's no expenditures at all for the member. Everything would be paid at 100% including the office visit copay, any diagnosis screenings that occur. So that would be 100% covered. So that would eliminate any out-of-pocket exposure at all for a member and their family. Now that's not going to be a solution for every <laughs> medical service you need, but the plan is designed to help um, control the cost to the employee and provide some alternatives. The neighborhood family clinic is uh, our employees have told us that they wanted some freedom to choose where they go. Um, this is a little bit of a hybrid that's in our plan, um, where some plans like an HMO prescribe where you go. Uh, you aren't prescribed to go to the neighborhood family clinic, but it's an option um, which can help avoid some of the out-of-pocket expenses. Thank you, Janice. Okay. So Janice, can I ask you this? To just to clarify, so if, if a staff member goes to a doctor and they pay their copay of say $25 and they don't have any diagnostic tests, they have like a checkup or, or whatever, but they don't have like a ultrasound or anything like that, they don't incur an additional 10% of that office visit. They would not have to pay beyond their $25 copay or whatever their copay is. They don't, then they don't also have a 10% charge on top of that. That is correct. Okay. So the only charge they would have would be the $25 copay, and that would be for either a primary or a specialist uh, physician appointment. Okay. So the 10% is for additional testing that might be Anything ordered. that would apply towards the deductible, and once that deductible's been met, then the coinsurance would be the, never, the next level of cost sharing. Okay. All right. That's all I have. So with the family plan, with the 500 HRA, the maximum out of pocket is really 1,500. I mean, if they use, because they would have that 500 available to them. So if they do the $1,000 deductible, they pay that because of procedures and things, then they would, in order to get to that $2,000, another $1,000, they would need to have an additional ten thousand dollars in procedures or tests in order to pay another because that's ten yeah. percent at the co at the right, co-insurance co amount. co-insurance yeah. thank you <clears throat> other questions okay thank you very much then we will move on to buildings and grounds facilities maintenance study mr. Daly and mr. Clark <clears throat> Good evening, Mr. Daly, and welcome. Well, thank you, Mr. <laughs> and um, Costello over there. <laughs> um, in addition to welcoming Mr. Daly, I'd like to welcome some of the um, Buildings and Grounds Facilities uh, members who are here. Uh, Travis Simpson and Amy Simpson are here. I know Mr. Dresden was going to try to make it, but he had some family uh, guests from out of town. He was here uh, for the meeting of that 
committee earlier tonight. And then, of course, Mr. Mettinger uh, chairs uh, that committee. In addition to these individuals, I'd like to thank uh, former and current committee members who uh, contributed to the report that uh, you received in written form tonight. Former board member Kari Treadway was instrumental in uh, starting the work uh, of this committee on this project. Pete Barsness, a high school staff member. Mike Banashek, a community member. Uh, Frank Jeffords, uh, assistant supervisor of buildings and grounds. Uh, and as I mentioned, Lloyd uh, Dresden. Uh, of course, uh, Amy and Travis uh, as well. And John. Uh, the purpose of the committee related to this project was to evaluate if uh, we are meeting our stewardship obligation uh, to the community by properly maintaining the school district buildings and sites, uh, the sites and buildings that uh, hard-earned taxpayer dollars were uh, used for, used uh, very purposefully to uh, support the educational needs of this community and the community's children. Jay and I will be going back and forth on this. Um, so during the 2011-12 the school year, and I think it was later in the school year, I think it was after we got done uh, figuring out capacity at the high school, uh, the facility and uh, we, the committee started studying the facility and site capital maintenance schedule of the district. The study included historical records um, of the projects and, and forecast future capital maintenance needs using life cycle models. Capital maintenance needs represent repair, upkeep, replacement work that must be performed at ex on existing facilities, mechanical systems, facility finishes, equipment, site improvements, site infrastructure. Meeting the capital maintenance needs ensures facilities and sites continue to function effectively. And as you see on the bottom of that slide, as of June 30th, 2012, and I think that's an insurance number, the district owned about $140 million in improved facilities and property. So at the conclusion of that initial study, the committee uh, came to realize that the current budget uh, resource is of about $160,000 for capital maintenance. This within John Daly's uh, buildings and grounds budget was really insufficient to fund the district's existing capital maintenance needs. So $140 million in facilities just can't be maintained with $160,000 worth of resources. Uh, the funding falls short of the needs by approximately $250,000 each year. This shortfall prompted some significant in, uh, concern, including um, the district facilities and sites not fully providing for the needs of students and staff, and then our stewardship obligation to the district uh, taxpayers who entrust us with maintaining the facilities and sites purchased with tax dollars. They've always supported us um, with referendums. Um, the adverse impact of deferred maintenance will have on will have on future sustainability. The fiscal sustainability concern stems from studies that show that for each dollar of preventive maintenance missed will ultimately cost $4 in deferred maintenance and repair. Simply stated, if we don't have $1 to put toward maintaining facilities today, how will we come up with $4 needed to accomplish this tomorrow? The committee investigated how is it that the district fell behind by $250,000 per year on capital maintenance projects. So we went back and studied that issue and found there to be uh, several reasons. Uh, the district has increased overall funding to the Buildings and Grounds program in the past 10 years. So the amount used to, uh, budgeted for this has not remained the same. It has increased. Most of the increases are attributable, though, to Prairie View Elementary School and Home and Middle School remodeling. And so the dollars that were introduced were actually introduced to address new facilities. Uh, the dollars made available to uh, address existing facilities was uh, not increased uh, in any great amount. Um, this, there was redirecting of the budget to meet annual operating needs. Operating needs left the capital maintenance uh, budget underfunded. 
Some of the operational needs that increased over time were the utility rates. There was a stormwater utility introduced, a new fee that uh, the district was required to pay. There were inflationary increases to things like refuse removal, snow removal, uh, laundering services, and a long list of other activities within the department. Um, those operational activities continued to eat away at, erode, uh, the capital maintenance uh, budget. Um, the district has recognized that it's underfunded capital improvements. In response to this, the district has historically funded a portion of capital maintenance with new facilities construction referenda. You've heard me talk about this uh, many times before. Um, this meant we included some high cost maintenance projects associated with existing facilities in referendums, um, in referendum questions for new facilities. Some examples include when we built Prairie View, including Evergreen um, for some HVAC upgrading and uh, Viking for some flooring replacements, ceiling replacement, um, um, restroom remodeling. Um, in 2005, we replaced a roof at the middle school. Um, this strategy has allowed for the recurring infusion of adequate dollars to fund capital maintenance needs so long as enrollment growth prompted a facility construction referendum every four to five years. As enrollment growth has slowed though, new facility referenda has moved to much longer intervals. The length of time, the length of these intervals does not provide the opportunity for referendum approved resources to fund capital maintenance needs. Does that make sense? So we were using these dollars that would get through referenda approval to do maintenance projects. Especially high ticket items. Yeah, and no surprise to anybody, we were forthright, uh, told the public, but when we no longer were having referenda for new school, uh, that resource dried up. Uh, it was a non-sustainable, non-recurring system of funding capital maintenance needs. Another thing that uh, helped us was the relatively young age of district facilities uh, throughout the 1990s and early 2000s. That meant many of the really high price maintenance items you might normally have with an aged building, we weren't facing. Well, I know some people refer to it as the new high school, but the new high school isn't new anymore. Um, 20. 20 years old. And so we have things that we have not historically had to pay um, that now are real costs for the district. So these are the three things that in ha uh, harmony, in combination, created this situation where we had a $250,000 shortage. Uh, that is, the operational budget kept eroding the maintenance budget. The operational referenda dried up to cover the costs. And our bu buildings kept aging. And so that's how we got to $250,000. At least that was the committee's determination. I think they're right. The committee next um, turned its attention to ident identifying how to address the annual capital maintenance funding shortage. The committee identified 17 potential solutions to the funding sort shortage. Uh, you'll find that in the, uh, the, the 40 some odd page report that uh, you were given. In an effort to identify which of those solutions was most viable, the committee developed a process for evaluating those solutions. The evaluation process used a common set of seven solution rating ca categories. Those categories were, some of them were of the quality of service um, provided by buildings and grounds, the efficiency uh, of using the resources, fiscal sustainability, flexibility, um, public engagement, seven categories that we used um, to rate those those 17 solutions. We, were, we gave those ratings a plus, a zero, or a minus, depending on um, if, they, if, they, if they helped or really had no effect or had a negative effect on each of those ratings. So a solution uh, rating could range from a plus seven to a negative seven. This rating system was not to provide a finalized ranking of the solutions, however. The rating system was intended to narrow the list of 17 potential solutions to a list of solutions that was most viable and deserving of 
further consideration. Just some additions to Mr. Daly's comments. So the intent of the committee was to be thorough and thoughtful, the whole 17 and then a structure for evaluating those, um, along with providing explanations uh, to the board why we didn't bring all 17, uh, why we thought it was only responsible to do some more work as a committee to narrow this to what we thought were the most viable. Plus in this scenario could be really considered kind of a driving force, a reason why to do a specific solution, and a mine is considered to be a <clears throat> restraining force, something that's going to get in the way of implementing a solution. And so it was this combination of driving and restraining forces, pluses and minuses, that led to the identification of six most highly probable, more driving forces than restraining forces uh, recommendations. And you can see those uh, on the screen. Um, I won't read them. There's much more complete uh, descriptions of each of these within the, as Mr. Daly reminded you, 40-page report, um, if you uh, want to get a deeper understanding of what each of those um, solutions is. As Jay said, none of these solutions had a perfect plus seven rating. Um, therefore, each of these solutions includes some restraining forces. Um, the restraining forces will need to be weighed against the driving forces, the plus ratings, to determine the best solutions to be implemented. Are we on the summary, John? Yes, we are. Excellent. The district is underfunding facility capital maintenance. Underfunding is leading to deferred maintenance. Deferred maintenance has an adverse effect on programs and district finances, now and even more so into the future. Uh, there are a limited number of solutions that might be implemented to address this deferred maintenance, each with its own unique advantages and disadvantages. Again, the Buildings of, Ground, Buildings of Grounds and Facility Committee has identified the six most viable solutions for the school board to consider in addressing the district's underfunded capital maintenance needs. These solutions um, include, and again, I'm not going to read all those. Um, you can see them up there. And I would encourage you to take a look at that detailed report. A lot of work went into it, and I want to thank all the members of the committee who worked on this. It was, it was quite a project. We're not done yet, but. At tonight's um, committee meeting, we offered to the committee members that if they felt they wanted to offer some specific words that um, we'd suggest to the board you allow them to do that. Would that be all right? I know that. Yes, that would be welcome. Hi. Um, thank you for letting me speak. Um, we've spent a long time, uh, like I said, over a year and a half working on this. and. Um, um, my name is Travis Simpson. Um, uh, I've been on the board for probably about two years now. Um, I work in this field of facility management. Um, I currently oversee uh, the buildings and grounds for the Diocese of La Crosse, uh, of which uh, there's 854 facilities. Um, there's roughly 65 schools that are active that I oversee. And one thing that I can say to the board is from personal experience, um, I've witnessed what underfunding your maintenance can do to facilities and their ability to operate. Um, when I first came to the diocese, there was 86 schools that were active. Uh, through the lack of maintenance on many of them, they could no longer uh, afford to make necessary repairs to the building envelope and keep the structures viable so that they could operate. Um, and it, it's, it's very appealing to fund other operations that get more visibility because uh, people are inclined to maybe ignore that roof or that boiler or that mechanical system that needs to be replaced. And what they don't realize is what that costs them in operational funds as the building uh, continues to operate through the year. For facilities that are maintained, um, that will eventually pay off. These projects will pay off for themselves if you do the proper uh, project management analysis on them. Uh, projects that uh, will deliver a return on investment of five to seven years and under are.
projects that should absolutely be done because they will bring funds back to your operations once those projects have paid themselves off. Um, the statement that John Daly made earlier, every dollar that you take away from maintenance does, it, it's a very accurate rule of thumb, will cost you roughly $4 in repairs later on down the line. If you can't afford to spend that dollar on maintenance right now, you definitely won't be able to afford the $4 repair that it's gonna hit you with later on down the road. Um, you can kick the can down the road, but it'll eventually, you'll have to deal with it. And, and the way of dealing with it, whether it's a referendum back to the taxpayer or what other vehicle you decide to use, uh, you'll, you'll eventually have to pay Peter and Paul. So um, that's, that's really all I needed to say, I guess. And uh, uh, I'll leave it up to the board to uh, make their decision. Any questions? I just want to make a few comments. Sure. Just, just having the opportunity to work with this committee for, for a while, and there was a lot of work went into this, and I think the board has seen it was a 42-page report, and you got the executive summary tonight. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we talked about this, and, and you know, the, the comment that really hit me is the new high school. I think I refer to it as the new high school, and they said it's 20 years old, and, you know, that's, I was in high school five years ago, too. But, um, <laughs> just, just, you know, how, how time seems to go. And, and those things really do age. And I think if you take a look at uh, Appendix A, page 15 of that, you'll really start to see where they've identified in a seven-year plan, there is a growing gap between what the budget has and where the funding um, for just some of the maintenance things are coming. And that's only going to continue to grow. And I think that's something that as a board we really need to get um, on our radar because I think it's, you know, we're not just talking about buildings. We're talking about working conditions for staff. We're talking about working conditions for our, our students, or excuse me, learning conditions for our students. And it's important that we, we really take that, uh, you know, as we look ahead to some of the budgeting and the priorities. I also want to thank the committee here because they didn't just come to a problem and put the data together. Um, took time uh, and, and the committee did a lot of work on this to identify possible solutions um, and then now have presented that to the board and I know it's really just tonight for information purposes but I really would like to encourage the board and um, ask the board president to, to really schedule this at a meeting again soon so that the board can formally accept this report and then uh, really come up with some sort of plan of action for what the board would like to see going forward to how do we to really address some of these uh, uh, long-range um, issues that the district is facing right now with uh, the increasing maintenance costs of the buildings and the aging of them. So. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Yeah, I think that we all have recognized have been the board <coughs> for a while, and the public in general have watched John work his magic for the last five or ten years and and uh, saved us uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars on energy costs and and his due diligence on maintaining the buildings and stuff. Every time he comes to us with a project, it's, it's if we do this now, it's going to save us twenty thousand. If we do this now, it's going to save us ten thousand. So we know that he he done his due diligence on these maintenance projects. And I, for one, am not surprised that it's finally come home to roost. We've been talking about it for years, where our income is leveling off and our expenses are rising. Or sooner or later, they're going to intersect. We're going to have more expenses than we have income, so we're going to have to take some action. And uh, I think that time has come. And I would, to Mr. Menninger, Menninger's comments, um, I don't have the budget. I don't. I know that you had forwarded Dr. Carlson some initiatives to us, where um, for some technology and other things we were looking at. Was the maintenance? Is there an increased allocation in the maintenance area as part of the budget recommendation? For the upcoming year, or the upcoming were, you, were you waiting for this report to be done? No, what we had done for the upcoming year, part of the preliminary budget that the board had approved back in February, includes an increase not just to buildings and grounds, but most of all our other buildings and departments. Um, I'm speaking of a, a roughly a 10% increase, but again, that is actually going back three years, three years ago, four, four years, years ago. Yeah where everybody was cut 10%. So it's really trying to get people back up to where that level was four years ago. Um, and I, there might have been a, a very, um, I'll say, 
small amount one time that uh, in addition but the primary piece and I don't know what that is in dollars offhand but it was that 10 percent um, bringing that back uh, just with the other yeah we had the one-time allocation this year also for the boiler that we did at the correct the high school yes right and that's an important distinction what and I don't know that I said it was two hundred and sixty thousand dollars a year these are really recurring costs uh, in terms of this long-range maintenance uh, plan that we have as opposed to uh, while helpful uh, the one time kind of address it and then uh, hope you have the money uh, to do it again the next year well and I know that in the past for some of those one-time kind of things the roof I think on evergreen or something right I think when those come up what we have done and maybe looking back it wasn't the best thing but we've required that they pay back that fund balance which obviously then takes out of the annual you know I mean it's I think it's a good discussion we need to have that fund balance I've always said I'm not I know why it's there and I know that it helps us through the highs and lows but if it's there for those emergency kind of things and yet when we have an emergency kind of thing happen and then we require that we pay it back it, it may be yeah we the use best thing to do but it may also impact us negatively yeah. we used the fund balance for a couple of things one was an unanticipated roof issue yeah. at, at evergreen when we were doing the HVAC work out there and we ran into this roof problem that we just had no idea was there um, and then we also used it for some lighting projects which is paying us back mm -hmm. too so I think we paid those back to the fund yeah. balance yeah and you'll see fund balance is one of the potential solutions the yes. committee's advancing mm -hmm. it doesn't mm -hmm. score as high as some others because I, I think President Hancock as you're pointing out it has some restraining I mean right. there's some downsides to it, it. should yeah. be mm -hmm. I, in my my philosophy is that it's not an ongoing a use for mm -hmm. ongoing maintenance but for those true emergency things not anticipated that's and that's one of the it. reasons it didn't score so well so sustainability or uh, you know matching a recurring need with a one-time revenue source it scored a minus on that yeah and so that's one of the things that's holding it back as a, a real viable long-term solution I think too as a board we probably could receive five or ten more reports like this of areas where we're not spending enough adequate dollars so I would think in again uh, finishing Tim's comments ask the administration to come to us with a recommendation as well as where do we go from here this is a study that was done now by a committee which you know I love the the buildings and grounds committee is one of those committees that's made up of community members stakeholders of staff of administration that's how it should be now we've asked them to do all this work what are we going to do with it and in my mind I think the next step is the administration should come to us and bring to the board a recommendation because as I said it could be five different things and all of a sudden we've spent the whole budget on those areas of need and um, we'll let the experts I guess in the, in those dollars come to us with a, a recommendation I think based on this so if, if that's we, we had a very uh, somewhat similar conversation mm -hmm. tonight you know, about the importance of the community members on the right. committee and you know then somebody brought the question up well what is the board going to do with this report <laughs> and uh, I said well there's a lot of other issues as well that are all and I said I think it's important to get this on the board's radar and make the board aware of this um, so that we can talk about how <coughs> we're going to address this because yeah. there are you are you, we even talked about it there are you're right multiple other needs um, that we have out there as well and okay. this is, is one of them wonderful any other questions or comments um, just that I agree with the statements that I think it's very important for you as the public that are listening tonight that you know what kind of choices your school districts have to make with limited funds and everything and I think John thank you because you you bring a picture <laughs> to what might be falling apart <laughs> and what we need to fix and how in our homes we do have to maintain so that we don't pay quadruple down the road. And uh, we do the same with personnel. We do the same with curriculum. We do the same with transportation. And you know, we hear all these things. And um, these are not easy solutions. And I agree with Cheryl, our administration, I trust, are going to come. And you, John, are going to come and 
prioritize, but I think it needs to be said, our school district is sort of like our homes. We can't fix everything that needs fixing this year. And in saying that, that breaks your heart because you know as a homeowner, <laughs> it's hard to choose between fixing the cracks in the basement or the roof when they both need fixing. Um, I appreciate your hard work and um, appreciate administration's work and and going back and figuring out mm -hmm. what's first, second, third, fourth. Yeah, we don't want to find ourselves, I think, a neighboring school district to the south, um, two districts to the south, saw themselves in a referendum. and They talked about the maintenance and the pulling back of maintenance and unfortunately found themselves in a fix. And um, John, I think often we compliment you and your staff for the outstanding work that you do and we do appreciate that. but. Um, I think we sometimes tie your hands too but <laughs> by not giving you the means to, to even do better. So we've had a long history of successful referendums and our schools um, are clean and they, are, um, they look nice and they're a welcoming place and that's all part of students learning. You want them to have a, an environment that is safe and is um, welcoming to them. We also are talking about some of the safety initiatives that Buildings and Grounds Committee um, has passed, so I think there, you know, there, there's some good things that are probably going to be coming this next few months for us to discuss and to prioritize. But John, thank you for um, the work that you and your staff do, and continue to be complimented. And then thank you also to the committee and its hard work. Because I know I sat in on the committee for a, a few months, and I was overwhelmed at all that they were going mm -hmm. to accomplish. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay, then moving on to buildings and grounds, tennis court resurfacing. Thank you. Thank you. I've got a couple of bids just to present to you tonight. And I'm also asking the board to approve them tonight to be sure these projects are done in the summer months. Um, this is a bid summary sheet uh, to resurface the tennis courts located at the Lock On Park at Viking. The tennis court's in really in pretty good shape, but it's needed, it needs some resurfacing. I only received one bid on this project, uh, but it was within budget. Uh, uh, I got a bid from Farner um, Asphalt Sealers uh, Valley Seal Coat, who did this project the last time, didn't give us a bid, though I hmm. called them and sent them a bid notice and advertised as per policy and called other companies. It's the only bid I received. So <laughs> the lock-on is a, a federal was a federal grant that was. Um, given to develop that park out there. So we do have an obligation to continue to maintain that park. And, and this is just part of it. So, so I am uh, um, recommending that we accept the bid from Farner Asphalt Sealers for 17,460 to resurface that tennis court. The other one is some, for some flooring work at the high school. Uh, we'll be replacing some hallway park uh, carpet in the 500 wing with an epoxy floor system. This will be a fairly new system for us. We do have some, I think, at Sand Lake, um, but the, this epoxy system is uh, really the coming thing. Um, it's a low maintenance floor, no stripping or waxing. You just really wet mop it or go across it with an automatic scrubber and you're done with it. Uh, uh, Prairie du Chien schools have gone exclusively to this. Sparta, Toma, Black River Falls also have these floors and, and their maintenance people just just love these floors. They are, they're um, They've actually said they pay for themselves in a number of years, just in labor and and uh, um, uh, material costs. And I did receive, as I said, four bids, and I would make a recommendation recommendation to accept a low bid from HTF Solutions for twenty five thousand two hundred seventy eight dollars. Again, this is for carpeting in the five hundred wing at the high school in the hallway. Um, this actually, the, this, these dollars will come from the operational referendum that we had for that high school edition, the sinking fund that was developed with that. And that's it. So you're going to replace the carpeting with this epoxy? Yes. Yeah, we'll pull the carpeting out and they, and they uh, prep the floor and put this epoxy right over the concrete. What, what effect does that have on, on the noise in the building, I wonder? We took the carpeting out of the two, 200 wing and the, and the 100 wing several years ago and replaced it with vinyl tile. I don't think it's been a big issue. Um, Mr. Bear and I have had several discussions about that. I know when Bernie was here, he, that's what he worried about was, was the noise, but 
Um, the halls brightened up, uh, much easier to clean, look much cleaner. Um, um, and I think they're really happy with how the tile was out there. I suppose the hallway is full of high school kids. It's not going to get very much quieter anyway. <laughs> it's probably just during passing time anyway. Yeah. And it's going to be noisy. It might be different if you had a two-floor building, and you, yeah. on the second floor you might want carpeting just for that reason, but not on, not on that. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Those two items then are on the um, consent agenda. So moving on, board member reports and discussion. I'll call on board members in order of roll call to present any comments or committee reports that they have. Mrs. Jagosinski. I have, I really have nothing. Okay. This time. Mrs. Mayor. I have nothing. Mr. Menninger. Uh, two quick things this evening. Once again, thanks to the Building and Grounds Committee for uh, their hard work and putting that together. And I see Mr. Simpson, so thank you. And uh, then lastly, um, it would not be a meeting in the summer if I did not remind everyone that there are only two more board meetings before the start of football practice. So just right. always like to point that out. Thank you. Um, Mr. Trivet. Oh, I have nothing to make. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mrs. Collins. I don't have Wow, Mr. Dunlap. Wow, everybody's quiet. Of course, I have to speak for Joe, so I'll have something. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say there's a set of finance committee notes on the on the agenda that uh, everybody has and then uh, fourth of july is coming up and uh, i caution everybody to be safe and sound again thank you mr gittens same ditto <laughs> <laughs> and i really don't have anything either except to celebrate and have a good fourth of july we will see you after the fourth of july um, then moving on i would just note that we have a July 8th meeting, July 22nd, August 12th, and then the August 26th meeting. Again, we have our regular school board meeting, the budget hearing, and the annual meeting all on that evening, um, beginning at 6 o'clock, and then September 9th is our next board meeting after that. District Administrator's Report, Dr. Carlson. You just note the happenings. You have some comments, uh, updates from the middle and high school. The elementaries had actually completed in the last uh, last month, uh, they finished up their reports for the school year. So, other than that, unless there's questions, I have nothing further than what was in your board packet. Okay. So then, moving on to consent agenda items, you have a number of consent agenda items. I think there are ten things there, ten items. Um, I would entertain a motion or allow for you to take out any item to be considered separately. If there are not anything, then I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda items as presented. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Okay, a motion has been made and seconded to approve the consent agenda items as presented. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Next item is executive session. Mrs. Mayor. Be it resolved that the Board of Education moves to executive session as per Wisconsin Statute 19.851C for the purpose of reviewing base wage negotiations. Okay, and if you would, is there a second? Second. I'll let you pick. And then if you would do roll call, please. Cheryl Hancock. Yes. Anita Jagosinski. Yes. Kate Mayer. Yes. Tim Minniger. Yes. Lisa Collins. Yes. Gary Dunlap. Yes. Joe Gittins. Yes. Okay, uh, we will spend five minutes and then we will reconvene.